You are now listening to the Hot Take Podcast, brought to you by Full Time Fantasy. Here are your hosts, Stephen Taroni and Josh Daddy. Time to make it hot. podcast and today but we have a slew of dynasty and redraft talk we're going to talk about our breakouts or fake outs um, a lot of good wide receivers and running backs to talk about josh we got a good episode today i'm very excited about it yeah buddy same here excited to get into some tight end talk and excited for our new segment and you know i've done some uh, collaborative uh work with uh with our guest before, but uh, excited to have him on the show today. Yeah, that's John Bauer of the Dynasty Theory Pod. What is going on, my friend? Hey, what's going on, guys? Thanks for having me. Hey, Steve, when you told me it was a 10 o'clock uh, uh, time frame here for recording, I was like, oh, man, that's well past my bedtime. So I got a nap in. I'm all revved up. I'm ready to go. Talk about some of these players. Redraft Dynasty. Let's go. <laughs> oh man, you and me both, brother. I got a nice little nap in today. Um, <laughs> I was I turned on the fantasy footballers and I was watching their their latest, and I promptly fell asleep. Um, so that was, that was a nice, <laughs> but it was necessary, you know, that 10 p.m. time frame. Uh, we have to wait for see. We have to wait for for Josh's uh, kids to go to bed. Uh, that's that's how that goes. Yeah, then that was that was quite a struggle today, by the way. So, <laughs> so you guys have done work together at Fantasy Pros. Yeah, we've, uh, I know John's been on a few, I think uh, one of the rookie pieces that we did recently, and I think we've done, uh, so we did something else I think earlier this year as well, because I know that's kind of how, um, anytime we do these, I like to kind of follow some of the guys, uh, if I'm not following them already, I like to get on there and, uh, you know, do, you got to support one another on Twitter, it's what it's all about, it's a great community. I was just going to ask, how long have you been with Fantasy Pro? Yeah, so I've been writing for them for about four months now. And just like Josh said, we've done some of the collaborative pieces, some of the the mock drafts, some of the you know uh, breaking down players maybe that we think are going to outperform or underperform compared to their ADP. But some of the the articles that I've written, you know, one that I just did it was second year tight ends, and it, you know it kind of really flows well with what we're going to talk about here tonight with your top ten tight ends in 2020. But then one of the pieces that I'm working on for the middle of July is going to be some players that had either they they finished 2019 really really strong or on the other hand they they really floundered so kind of talking about recency bias how we can use that to our advantage especially from for dynasty purposes because you take part in all these startups throughout the off season and the last five weeks whether or not we should be putting so much stock into them uh you know dynasty owners they do and it's you know one of the situations heading into 2019 you look at a player like Adam Thielen he got off to such a hot start in 2018 and then he kind of fizzled down the stretch and I think a wide receiver that people kind of look at from that perspective for 2019 is Cooper Cup if you would have talked to people mid-season when he had that fantastic start people would have said oh he's a top six seven eight dynasty wide receiver but now in startups because he kind of I don't want to say he underperformed but once Higby really got involved again talking about the tight ends um you know, I, I think people start whistling a different tune. So just kind of how recency bias is going to play a role in startups and people's values. Oh, man. And yeah, we're going to get into some of those guys today that are very relevant for what you're talking about. Um, but before we get into that, I just want to talk about Debo Samuel. Big news today that came out. Debo Samuel unfortunately broke his foot. Uh, so it looks like it's a Liz F- Frank injury. Um, and we've seen this before with wide receivers. Um, and if you've not heard of a Liz Frank injury, just turn on Twitter and just scroll through and you'll literally read about it today because that's all I see right now on my timeline. Um, and it looks like uh, 10 to 12 weeks is the expected timeline for Debo to get back. So he that will cut into the beginning of the season um, or the presumed season, I should say. So, yeah, I, I think we all, you know, me and Josh are huge uh, Brandon Ayuk fans, okay? So I think everyone's calling for Ayuk. All the truthers are coming out right now. And all those, you know, weird truthers that like 
brag when someone else gets injured. They're coming out for some reason. I hate when those guys come out. Like, yeah, see, I told you he was going to get hurt. So, yeah, that's why I drafted Brandon Ayuk. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, buddy, that doesn't make any sense. Um, but, uh, John, I'll start with you. Besides Ayuk, um, is there any other wide receiver on this uh, 49ers team that you're interested in? Or is it just more uh, George Kittle and then more running back uh, uh, shares that you want? This this wide receiver core, and Steve, just like you said, if you scroll through Twitter, you could see five tweets in a row. One is going to be talking about whether or not Debo Samuel is now a buy in Dynasty, which a lot of people, if there's an overreaction from the current owner, that's kind of their take. But then just like you said, Brandon Ayuk, uh, people were even touting, oh, if you're in a deep league, go look at Kendrick Bourne, look at Jalen Hurd, uh, Dante Pettis. Fans are creeping back out again after what happened in 2019 right. where he barely saw the field. But, you know, just just like you said, it looks like the time frame is 10 to 12 weeks, and that's just what I'm reading as well. You know, I'm not a doctor. It's not a professional opinion. You're but not a doctor? I, no, I, you know, I, no, but I, I did stay at a Holiday Inn last night. Isn't that kind of how – no, but – I don't have through all my dynasty rosters. I don't have Debo Samuel on one roster, and it's kind of that way with a lot of the 49ers wide receivers. Just because we know they're a run first offense, George Kittle is going to you know demand at least a 20 25 percent target share, and I just I don't know if Jimmy Garoppolo is the quarterback, and especially with that scheme to really support a high-end wide receiver. And I know we've seen it with Shanahan's offenses in the past where he's had players, you know, you look at players like Julio Jones, obviously, where you have that alpha, but I, I just don't see it with Debo. And while a lot of people are saying go out and buy him, I don't know if anybody that owns him is going to sell him at a discount. So sure, you can try. It doesn't hurt to try, but I just don't know if that's going to be, you know, a realistic outcome for you to get him at a discount. Now, if you have you know, any belief in those other wide receivers, just like you said, Brandon Ayuk, now's not the time to buy because everybody's expecting, okay, Debo, even if he is back for the start of the season, there's going to be some uh, uh, some setbacks there. And, the, you know, I'm seeing all these different probabilities and statistics of uh, the chance for re-injury. So, you know, I, I just, I, I don't think now is the time to buy. But if you have a guy like Brandon Ayuk, you're feeling pretty good based on based on this news that we found out today. Yeah, Josh, uh, what are your thoughts? I mean, is there anyone else, or is it just more Kittle, more running backs? Um, you know, uh, John, you mentioned a couple of these receivers. Uh, Jalen Hurd is another guy, uh, you know, that I think a lot of uh, Dynasty and Debbie people are really into. So is there any of these wide receivers interest you? You know, we talked a couple episodes ago about how I personally thought this offense was going to get a little more high-powered in the passing attack. So this kind of I think this quells that a little bit. Uh, but it does kind of give some answers maybe to the questions like, you know, how is Jalen Hurd going to make an impact? So, um, you know, glad you guys brought him up because I do think that if anyone's going to step forward, you know, it's definitely going to be a mix of him. And I still think Ayuk's probably going to lead the uh, the receiving core here. Uh, you know, personally, I had a share of Debo and I actually sold him to get some Kenyon Drake, uh, believe it or not, this off season. But in that same league, I actually drafted Ayuk. Um, so, kind of a bonus there, but um, I do think Kittle's probably going to be, you know, the main beneficiary from a target's perspective, at least from kind of the, uh, the offense as a whole. Uh, but I do think it's, it's probably going to lean a little more heavier. Like we saw last year with this run game in some of these games where guys like Tevin Coleman and Raheem Mostert were scoring like, you know, three, four touchdowns. So uh, even Jeff Wilson, you know, <laughs> guys like that. So it, it could definitely, you know, trend that way. You never really know with Kyle Shanahan, right? The dude's offensive genius. Um, so I, I think they'll be fine, you know, regarding this. Uh, but it's it's going to be tricky to see how this plays out because you know, these these foot injuries, man, they can be hit or miss as far as recovery time. So wishing all the best to Debo. Most definitely, yeah. And uh, he, he should be able to recover um, from this. I, I think that in the past when receivers try to rush it or they're rushed back, um, that's when the injury can pop up again. Um, but of course, I mean, anyone is susceptible to a re-injured uh, foot uh, of, of this you know, kind of injury. I, I'll say, you know, if Debo, you know, he's obviously going to slip completely in drafts where he was going maybe in the, you know, seventh, eighth round, he's going to go in the 12th, 13th 
Um, you know, and you can pick him up. I, I think if you want to just wait on Debo, if you think if that's your guy, um, uh, you know, grab him up. Um, I think that it's going to be, you know, it, it's going to eat at a roster spot. Um, so obviously you have to consider that. But, you know, anytime there's an injured player and you know, okay, you know, he's probably going to miss like three or four weeks. Um, and then, you know, he'll be back for the season. You know, you can look at that as, you know, perceived value. So there is that at least uh, in redraft. Um, so and, and Steve, real quick, just, just like you said there in redraft, you have these shorter benches. And one person, I think we all respect his work, Mike Clay, he put out his updated projections today for the San Francisco 49ers. And I, I think to an extent, you know, even though he does fantastic work, I think he's guessing a little bit. But he dropped Debo down to nine games played here in 2020, and that's how he um, statted him out. So if you are looking to draft him and redraft, and you don't have, let's say, you know, you can put a player on an IR spot if they're on the pup or whatever, but if you have to sit on him for several weeks, that that could be an issue there in redraft where you don't have, obviously, as many roster spots as you would in a dynasty league. That's exactly right. Yeah, it depends on the roster spots. I mean, you know, in like these 10 team redraft leagues, you're probably not going to uh, draft Debo at the end, but a deeper uh, roster. I mean, yeah, sure. Because I mean, it's, you know, not all, it's not all the time how, how you start, it's how you finish. You obviously want to have a good start. That's very important in fantasy football, but you always want to project for the future too. And, you know, a stud like Debo Samuel, I, I think that he's worth, you know, that, that maybe 13th round pick um, in, in a redraft league uh, if he's going to miss some time. Let's get into the opening here of, you know, talking about just Clyde Edwards Hilaire and uh, Jonathan Taylor. I want to get your perspective, John, from a dynasty perspective, because obviously we know these guys are studs. They're already being drafted as they're, they are the perceived starters in redraft. So you're going to have to pay for either. Um, running back and with Clyde Edwards Hilaire in some cases you're going to have to pay a second round pick in redraft but what about Damian Williams and Marlon Mack you know both of these guys had success last year both offenses were projecting to be very good obviously we know about the Chiefs but you know Phillip Rivers and the Colts they have one of the best offensive lines in the in the league uh, and they've got some weapons now on the outside so I think there's value to be had with Damian Williams and Marlon Mack. Uh, John, what is your perspective with, you know, these guys from a redraft uh, um, outlook? And then, you know, what are you thinking about them in Dynasty? I mean, are they worth a pick? They're going to be pretty much, you know, very, very cheap in, in Dynasty. So what is your outlook for both of these players? Yeah, so from a redraft perspective, I'm not going to have either of them just because of where they are going and whether it's mock drafts like we're preparing for the Scott Fishbowl or if we're doing early best balls here, but they're going way too early for where I would like to see them go. And I do think players like Damian Williams and Marlon Mack and even Naheem Hines, they're still going to have a role and be involved here in 2020. You know, for a few reasons, I, I know it's been it, it's been beaten to death here, but the whole situation with the COVID-19, we don't really know how it's going to play out, if there's going to be a season, and if there is when it's going to start, how the entire off-season programs are going to look. So with these rookies getting really acquainted, you know, and, and uh, acclimated into the NFL, I think that benefits players like Damian Williams, Marlon Mack, and again, even Naheem Hines, where they are still going to be used, and I actually, I don't have a huge difference when we look at half PPR in 2020 between Edwards Alaire and Damian Williams. You know, I have about a 35, 40 point differential there. So, so you know, it's still something, but where Clyde Edwards Alaire is going to be going, I'm not going to have him in any redraft leagues. And for the Colts, I actually, if it's PPR, I actually like Hines as the secondary option there in Indianapolis. Then once you drop to 0.5 PPR, if you're still playing standard, then Marlon Mack becomes the, the better option between the two. But I do think there's a bigger gap there. I prefer Jonathan Taylor, especially from a dynasty perspective. I, he just has that profile. And for me, Clyde Edwards Hilaire, he was my running back for going into the NFL draft. So it's tough for me because you have such an ideal landing spot. So of course his stock is going to rise, but Jonathan Taylor, for me, he feels like the safer option. I know a lot of people, well, look at his college workload. But if you go, you know, you look at different uh, doctors and, and they're tweeting stuff and they're showing all this information, there really is, I think the, the heavy college workload, it gets a, 
uh, you know, bad rap because people think, okay, they're not going to last as long in the NFL. And it doesn't seem like there's data to support that. So for me, redraft, I'm probably not going to have either. And then for dynasty, I prefer Jonathan Taylor slightly to Clyde Edwards Hilaire. They're both going to go super early. And I've seen some in super flex startups this off season where they're Edwards Hilaire, especially he's going in the first round and it seems like Taylor, he's going early second, but for me, it should be the other way around. And I prefer Jonathan Taylor and you know, that Kansas city offense, there is, there's plenty of volume and plenty of fantasy points to go around for that whole offensive unit. But I, I just don't think Damian Williams is going to disappear the way a lot of people would hope. Both Williams and Marlon Mack seem like for 2020 players you can draft and expect some production from them in like the first four weeks. Uh, John, you mentioned it about COVID-19. I mean, obviously it's going to affect the off season and, you know, some of these rookies might not, you know, be up to par on the playbook. I get that for someone like Clyde Edwards or Lair that's stepping into this role in Kansas city. He doesn't have to do a whole lot. He needs to be in shape. He needs to understand, you know, how, to, what, what his route uh, packages, what his blitz pickups are. But this offense is just going to be very fun. And it's going to be very easy for him to just fit in as a playmaker. So, it, you know, it's not going to be very hard for him to step in and find the role. The 208 ADP, that, that's something that you're going to have to make a decision. Um, and, uh, that, you know, it's very interesting. Uh, Josh, you know, for Damian Williams and Marlon Mack, do you think that they're worth, you know, a look in redraft? And then talk to me about them in Dynasty, too, because, like, they're so cheap in startups. I, I still think you can get at least a year out of them, right? So if you're thinking you're going to win now, and you can get them for cheap, I think that's a great pick. Yeah, I mean, personally, from a dynasty perspective, if you already own these guys, you know, I, I love both these guys. Uh, if you already own them, you know, I, I don't see the reason to panic sell. Uh, these guys are both going to provide value. But, you know, if you're a contender, that's probably something that you're going to have a little more, you're going to hold a little higher regard. But the, you know, if you're maybe a team that's rebuilding, I mean, these guys can still bring you back some sort of draft capital um, or maybe if you're trying to get, you know, a, a, like a younger tight end or something like that, or if you're trying to get, you know, just younger in a position, they could be pieces that you can move. But you're right. I mean, they're super cheap in redrafts and in, in uh, I'm sorry, in uh, startups. Uh, but in redraft, I absolutely love these guys. I mean, especially when you consider – you know, the likes of, you know, Tevin Coleman, Ronald Jones, um, you know, carry on Johnson, guys like that, that are going around here. I mean, I'd rather have, you know, Damian Williams than Jordan Howard. And, I, and I'm pretty high on Jordan Howard, you know, compared to the field. So, you know, these guys, I, I don't think we know that Clyde Edwards Hilaire can step in immediately, but with how explosive this chiefs offense is, and also with some of the upside of the Colts offense, I, I absolutely love the Colts offense this year. So I'm very high on both these guys in redraft, especially. So I think they can really, really pay off that value, especially where they're going as we record this. Josh, and I, I want to jump in real quick because there's something you said that I, I think is a really good point. I also like Jordan Howard. So you and I, maybe we could start a fan club or something. But you, know, you look <laughs> at players like Damian Williams and Marlon Mack, at their ADP in redraft especially – if anything were to happen to Jonathan Taylor, Edward Slayer throughout the season, they have league winning upside based on where you're going to be able to get them. So I think it was a great point. If you have that decision to choose, you know, a safer guy like Jordan Howard, who we can kind of anticipate his workload and maybe say, you know, you know, a mid to low end running back two is his absolute ceiling. And then you look at guys like Damian Williams, he does have a league winning upside if something were to happen. So, you know, if you're one of those people that likes to play for the high upside guy, I, I, I love what you said there, Josh. Yeah. I mean, these guys are pretty much going neck and neck right now, as far as ADP is concerned, whether you're using, uh, you know, fantasy pros, ECR or, you know, ADP, um, these guys are really, really close together, but I mean, I'd rather have Mac and Williams over treat Cohen. I'd rather have them over Sony Michelle. Um, you know, maybe even Philip Lindsay. And that's kind of where you start getting, uh, you know, into a big discussion. But, um, you know, all I'll say is like, I love the offensive line for the Colts. I think no matter who they give the rock to, whether it's a 50, 50, um, you know, we hope not obviously as fantasy owners, we don't want to see that 50, 50, you know, plus committee, but 
Um, it's that's just the way of the NFL right now. But both of these offenses are, are definitely going to put put both of these backs in a position where they can be productive for you, especially in best ball. I mean, these guys are going to come in handy in best ball for sure too. Yeah, why not get a piece of this offense, uh, you know, a, a viable piece at that in the running back position, right? So fantasy football calculator, 701, Damian Williams running back 31, and then Marlon Mack uh, running back 36 at the 803. Uh, yeah, you guys said it. I mean, these guys have standalone value right now. You know, I'm thinking that they're going to get the majority share for, you know, the first few weeks of the season. And then – if Jonathan Taylor plays really well, then yes, he will out-touch Marlon Mack. And then the same for Clyde edwards helaire But what if they don't, you know? If nothing is written in stone. I think we've seen, uh, you know, a lot of great running backs come out within the last four years. And that is skewing everyone's perspective right now that every running back is going to do that. We just don't know right at this point. So Nothing is set in stone. I think that these guys are worth that pick. It's no risk to draft these guys in the seventh, eighth round. And it's a great point, Josh. I mean, when you look at, you know, somebody like Philip Lindsay uh, or Jordan Howard, I mean, these offenses aren't that inspiring compared to what we're thinking about the Chiefs or the Colts. So, yeah, give me those two all day over them. And I do think that in Dynasty startups, you're just going to walk away with, you know, a, a running back that you can use at least for 2020. Um, and, and that's probably it. That's how you should look at it for right now. So at least, you know, you have that running back that could just fill in as a starter uh, right now. But guys, I, you know, I, I just, I have to talk to you guys about Robbie Anderson because, you know, I was walking my dog the other day and I was thinking about DJ Moore because I really want to talk to him, uh, talk about him uh, for the breakout or fake out that we're going to talk about. I want to talk about DJ Moore. And I was thinking about him and, you know, the, the Panthers offense. And I know that, Teddy Bridgewater is a dink and dunk kind of guy. Um, I I think that's why Robbie Anderson has fallen to this wide receiver 63. But I was walking my dog and I was thinking, and I just started laughing because Robbie Anderson is a really good wide receiver. Like we've seen him with the Jets and and all of the fantasy community is all over Robbie Anderson for the past couple of years. They're all over him. I mean, you know, he's going to be a breakout guy, wide receiver too, you know, high end upside. And now he's with this Panthers team and we, you know, he can't beat out DJ Moore. So, and there's so many targets to go around with Christian McCaffrey, but, you know, I just feel like they brought him in for a reason. He's going to be used. Um, And these seasons that we're talking about from Robbie Anderson, right. As far as um, his, you know, stats for the past few years, you know, 96 targets last year. Is he going to get around 96 targets this year? Maybe. Yeah, he, he could. Uh, 52 receptions, you know, 779 yards, five touchdowns last season. Obviously with more of a target share than he's probably going to get this year, but he could still end up being around this 50 receptions, 700 yards. Um, I, I just think that everyone's forgetting about Robbie Anderson. Um, Am I, am I crazy to be thinking about Robbie Anderson in this light? Like I'm actually, cause you know, I was in the Scott Fishbowl mock and I drafted him at the 1306 and I felt pretty good about it. I think that's a really solid value. I mean, you're talking, what did you say? He was the the wide receiver 63 or something ridiculous like that. Yeah. Um, he was, he finished as the 38 uh, overall. I mean, I won't, I won't spend a ton of time on this. I mean, we, you, we already talked about Robbie, like we love Robbie Anderson in best ball. He's like one of those, typical boomer bus guys but like you mentioned you go back and look at some of these numbers that he put up um you know uh, teddy bridgewater obviously you know you mentioned it, the dink and dunk but you know he's also had a young sam darnold uh he had josh mccown before that so the really the only time he's had like a gunslinger was his rookie season when he had ryan fitzpatrick and you know he saw the least amount of targets and receptions probably understandable as a rookie just coming into the league. Um, but we look at that 2017 season with a guy like McCown, who I'd say is probably the most comparable of the three quarterbacks, uh, three or four quarterbacks that Anderson's had to play with, you know, when you compare him with Bridgewater. So I, th- I feel like their games are the most similar and it could be beneficial for Robbie. Uh, you know, do I, I guess the easiest thing to say, is, do I think he's going to, produce you know to the to the tune like he did target wise last couple seasons maybe 
Uh, if he does, I think he's going to see an uptick in receptions. Um, I personally don't think he's going to see as many targets uh, in Carolina, but at the same time, you know, I think he could be a, lo- a lot more efficient as is, you know, the, <laughs> the offense goes as Teddy Bridgewater goes. So, and that's kind of his game, you know, that short efficient stuff. So I do think you're probably going to see a decline in targets, but it wouldn't surprise me to see similar reception totals from my, from last year. So yeah, why, why not take a chance on him that late in drafts? John, over or under wide receiver 40 for the year in 2020 for Robbie Anderson? See, I don't think there's anything crazy about him beating that. You know, especially at the wide receiver 68 or wherever you said he was going, that's definitely a value. And like Josh said, and it's kind of the typical response you get for receivers like this. Oh, he's good in best ball because he's going to give you those boom weeks. And one of the pieces that I wrote for Fantasy Pros, it was talking about air yards and how we can use that because, you know, you look at players where their receiving yards were that didn't really line up with their their, their air yards, and there was no real connection there. And there were two guys that came to, to top the list. You know, one of them was Kenny Galladay, but then, you know, there were two others. It was Robbie Anderson, Curtis Samuel. So I was very, you know, I was a little upset. One, that Teddy Bridgewater went to Carolina because I think Curtis Samuel, he could have done, you know, a little bit more with a quarterback more willing to take shots. But then also, Robbie Anderson coming over there so for me I think it's a really good move from an actual football perspective you have Robbie Anderson who can take the top off the defense it allows Curtis Samuel to play closer to the line and that's kind of what we saw out of him in college you know he was kind of that Swiss army knife role where he was getting a lot of carries getting those short uh, uh, targets and he was able to do things after the catch which we didn't see in Carolina thus far because he's been more of the deep ball you know player in that offense but just like you said Steve too we look at Teddy Bridgewater and we see that average depth of target and the the the, uh, intended air yards and it just isn't there so for a guy like Robbie Anderson yeah I think he's going to outperform that ADP do I feel comfortable starting him week to week probably not so yeah I think a big reason why Robbie Anderson's ADP is so low is DJ Moore And DJ Moore technically broke out last year. So, you know, our first candidate for breakout or fake out has technically already broke out. But I think what we need to talk about is, will he exceed his ADP? And Josh, do you have um, the Fantasy Pros ADP handy or should I just use Fantasy Football Calculator? Yeah, for, um, I have mine right now set at half PPR. And because I know we were going to talk uh, receivers and right now he's at the 13th as far as ECR goes, the expert consensus ranking, but he's uh, just one spot under that in ADP. So either way, you're talking about a top 15 receiver already. All right, John. So where are you at with DJ Moore? So I'm okay with him at that price. And, you know, uh, my co-host over one of my co-hosts over at Dynasty Theory, Mitch Sorensen, and I, we went through and we've put together our projections for 2020 and we have DJ Moore right there at wide receiver 12. You know, I think we can look at him and you can expect that target share, just like we talked about George Kittle with the 49ers, right? In that 20 to 24% range. Right. So I know people, they're worried about the connection that he and the entire team is going to have with Teddy Bridgewater, just like we talked about with Robbie Anderson. But as opposed to a player like Robbie Anderson, DJ Moore, he's okay with those shorter passes. And even though it's not really sustainable and predictive year to year, he is very good after the catch. So, you know, you look at the average depth of target for him, he ranked 46th in 2019. So he doesn't really need to rely on the air yards like a player like Robbie Anderson will. So I'm okay with him, you know, at that price. And you look at this team, that defense is going to be bad. That division is going to be, there's going to be a lot of shootouts. You have New Orleans, Tampa Bay, Atlanta. So this team's going to have to throw the ball. And I think DJ Moore, he's going to be one of the main beneficiaries, obviously. Josh, are you buying it? Breakout or fake out? Yeah, I mean, I think, like you said, he's even though he's technically broken out, I do think that he has a great chance to kind of exceed expectations in his ADP. Because when you're talking about, you know, the way his season played out last year, you, you know, 87 targets – and he almost got to 1,200 yards. I think there's going to be some some uh, you know momentum there in the targets. I think there's going to be momentum with the catches. 
and I also think he's going to have some some major positive uh, regression there in his touchdown totals as well. So, um, you know, when you think about the efficiency, like we mentioned, that's the that's the Teddy Bridgewater way. Um, you know, I think I think it's completely reasonable to think that, you know, he if he does get, uh, you know, the same amount of targets, or even if he gets a you know an uptick in targets uh, from last season. Uh, even if he gets like 150 targets, I mean, with the efficiency that we've seen from a Teddy Bridgewater, and I think it's going to be a little closer to the, maybe that 67%, like we saw when he was with Cam Newton in 2018. Um, so if he gets into that 67, you know, 68, 69 range, I mean, you're talking a guy that's going to have triple digit catches. So um, if we're talking about that and he gets into the box like seven, eight times, he's absolutely a top 10 guy. Triple digit catches. I like it. Yeah. So you're, you're saying that he's going over that hundred, I mean, 87 last year, that's not, you know, too far removed. Um, I, I have to say fake out, you know, if, so if we're talking about this uh, being better or worse than wide receiver 13, I'm just going to, I'm going to say worse. I'm going to lean that he's closer to that 17, 18 range um, mainly because of what I think this offense is going to be able to do. Bridgewater is going to spread it around. You know, he, like I said, Robbie Anderson is there. um, And that's kind of why I wanted to open up with him. Curtis Samuel um, and then Christian McCaffrey is getting, you know, 120 targets. Um, So it's tough uh, for, for a wide receiver like this to be like a top 12 guy. DJ Moore is super talented and we love that yak that he gives you. So with that in mind, he has that upside of a wide receiver one. And I think that's what the experts are seeing. That's what a lot of people are seeing when they draft him so high um, is that upside. Um, I, I just, I, I'm, I'm tempering my expectations with this offense in general. I think John, you have a good point though. I mean, you know, they could be in a lot of shootouts. Yeah. I, I don't think we're going to see, it's not going to be a ground and pound type situation. Obviously we talked about San Francisco earlier. And I think those two teams, they're going to be on opposite ends of the spectrum when we look at the splits between their passing percentage and what they're doing on the ground. But I just, you know, even with all the question marks and with Matt Roll and Joe Brady coming in, I I still like DJ Moore's upside. And Josh, like you talked about with the positive regression from a touchdown perspective, up to this point in his career, it seems like he's a guy that's going to demand and need targets. You know, we're not going to be able to count on him for that 10, 11, 12 touchdown season. But I think just, again, I, I do expect, I, I know what you're saying, Steve, that that Teddy's going to move the ball around and they have weapons. But I do think DJ Moore is going to be one of those go-to receivers that he's going to be comfortable with. And hopefully sooner rather than later can develop a nice rapport with him. He certainly fits you know, DJ Moore certainly fits what Bridgewater wants to do. So, you know, it it should be able to work. Um, I I think I'm just not buying that that wide receiver 13 right now. Um, Let's talk about Terry McLaurin, DK Metcalf, AJ Brown. Again, these guys broke out in their rookie season. Um, They all had, you know, exceeded expectations as far as what they could do. Now, AJ Brown was my, one of my favorite wide receivers. He was actually right behind and kill Harry uh, for my wide receiver two coming into the NFL draft 2019. So I love that AJ Brown broke out the way he did. Again, you talk about yak. I mean, this guy put on a clinic, um, probably not sustainable, um, but let's just talk about these three wide receivers um, and just rank them real quick for me, Josh, rank these three guys and will they all just repeat the success and move, take that step forward? Yeah, that's a good question, man. I mean, it's rare to see kind of three guys in the same draft class bust out the way they did. Uh, For me personally, I have DK and I have Terry McLaurin uh, just neck and neck in my rankings. I mean, I have those guys really close. Um, But surprisingly, I have A.J. Brown not that far ahead of them. I mean, most most rankings are going to have A.J. Brown kind of around that top 15, um, you know, right on the back end of like that that third tier of receivers and me personally, I actually have AJ Brown towards the top of my fourth tier with Terry McLaurin and DK Metcalf right behind. So, I mean, if I had to list them off, you know, I'm I'm still going to be kind of right in line with most, with most people. I'm going to have AJ Brown first. Um, 
but it's a lot closer. I think he might uh, not quite have as good of a season as he did last year. So just because of the, the I think they're going to run Derrick Henry just into the ground, man. And so it's going to be tough to see him, you know, have that big of an impact if he gets a similar target uh, market share. So I'm going to go ahead and say that AJ Brown is kind of a fake out uh, for me, but I do have him still just barely ahead of DK Metcalf and then Terry McLaurin right under DK. Yeah, it's tough with McLaurin because it's like, what can Haskins do? And, you know, obviously they played together in college, um, but we really don't even know if Haskins is going to play the full season. He could be out after three games. It just depends on how he plays. Or he could be, you know, a steal in in the draft, in in Scott Fishbowl, in Dynasty, all over the place. You know, we just don't know the outcome. So that's really hard for McLaurin. At least you know what you have with DK and – you know, what Russell Wilson is going to give you. John, how are you seeing these three receivers? And does any one of them just kind of like lead the way completely for you? In terms of rankings, I'm not going to be any different than Josh. It's going to go A.J. Brown, D.K. Metcalf, Terry McLaurin. But I think a lot of people are going to hate this. I, in terms of a fake out or breakout, I'm not going to have any of these guys in a redraft league. So from where they're going to be going versus my expectations here strictly in 2020, I'm going to say fake out for all three. I, I'm going to be below consensus on their their production. And Josh, like you said, you know, A.J. Brown, yes, he had a fantastic 2019, but that Tennessee offense, they had a – it was a historical season, and they had one of the most efficient seasons of all time. You look at their red zone touchdown percentage, it was astronomical. And a lot of his – a lot of his uh, numbers, they came after the catch. And you look at 2018, a player like Juju Smith-Schuster, and everybody was going nuts over him. But that was a player that really, uh, he thrived after the catch. And like I said, that's something that's not predictive and really it doesn't translate year to year. So that's something that I'm looking at with A.J. Brown. D.K. Metcalf, I have found that I'm higher on Tyler Lockett than most people. I still think if he's healthy, he's going to be the number one there in 2020. And, you know, is this the year that they let Russell Wilson loose? I think as long as Chris Carson can stay healthy, I know obviously he had the hip issue, but if he can stay healthy here in 2020, I think he's going to get a majority of the workload and they're going to still be a run first team. And then Terry McLaurin, Steve, like you said, we don't know if Dwayne Haskins is going to be the starter throughout the entire year, but also he was one of those guys that really benefited last year from not much around him. So like I said with Chris Carson, if Darius Geis can stay healthy and they can actually show some type of commitment to the run game, and now you have Antonio Gibson, you know, I think there are other options, but I, I, I'm going to be lower on all three of these guys here for 2020. Yeah, so, you know, uh, fantasy football calculator, um, and then you can compare with fantasy pros. Uh, Josh um, has A.J. Brown and D.K. neck to neck. Wide receiver 18, wide receiver 19, and full PPR, actually. Um, And DK is actually being drafted ahead of Tyler Lockett, which, I mean, come on. (laughs) When's the disrespect going to end for Tyler Lockett? I mean, let's just put our foot down and say this guy is good at football, um, and he is. And so if they really do let Russell Wilson lose, I think the only way that DK would finish ahead of Tyler Lockett would be touchdowns. It's if right. DK just turns into a touchdown machine and gets like 9, 10, 11. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't think that efficiency that we see every single season from Tyler Lockett is a mistake. I mean, he's he's like the only good receiver to come out of the Big 12 in like the last five years. So, I mean, it's, uh, he's, he's definitely legit, and I personally have Lockett. Uh, as my wide receiver 20 right now. And I'm actually really surprised you said A.J. Brown, what wide receiver 18. Yeah. I, that actually surprised me. I'm, you know, I I take part in so many dynasty startups where people are head over heels for him from a dynasty perspective. So he's going extremely early. So I'm surprised that he's actually wide receiver 18 there in the ADP. So maybe I'm not too far off on him. I have him wide receiver 21 and then DK 27 McLaurin 34. But I just, I think there's always going to be somebody, and Steve, you and I talked about this off the air before the show, there's always going to be somebody, whether it's Dynasty or Redraft, that's going to like these guys more than I do. Right. And, you know, I would like to pivot off of these guys. You know, you might even be able to get them a little bit later, 
but a Tyler Boyd. You know, the Calvin Ridley was one of my guys. I think the hype is really it's getting up there. And I'm one. I'm a huge proponent of Calvin Ridley. He's going to be a wide receiver one here in 2020. But those are guys that I would like to pivot off of these guys and target them if I could. But I think you know it might be a Boyd rather than these three because I think Calvin Ridley. I think his ADP is me creeping up. If I had to rank these guys, it would be AJ Brown. Terry McLaurin, and then DK Metcalf for the 2020 season. In Dynasty, all of these guys, you, I want on my roster. You know, I mean, John, you're talking about you don't want them on your roster in 2020, but I'm sure you want shares of these guys in Dynasty. So uh, let me correct myself. I, I would not mind them on my roster. It's just I'm not going to pay their current ADP. Sure. But yeah, Dynasty, especially, oh, I was so upset with myself. So before the 2019 draft, we said on an episode at the time it was super flexology. We said that AJ Brown, it did not matter where he landed. He was our wide receiver one. And then he went to Tennessee and like absolute idiots. We dropped him down our rankings. So I, that one still stings a little bit, but yeah, dynasty. I don't, I don't dislike any of them. And especially if you were able to get them in rookie drafts, you probably got them at a nice little discount compared to where they're currently going. Right. But yeah, I, I just, I don't dislike them just in redraft. Like I said, I'm probably not going to end up with them. I believe in Terry McLaurin's talent as a wide receiver one. What I saw last year out of him uh, impressed me more than the other two. All three se- seasons of these guys were so impressive. Um, and this class, you know, this rookie class, we might be talking about in a few years as one of the better classes um that we've seen you know i think about that 2014 um and then i'm i'm thinking about this one that can kind of compare to it but mclaurin just did so much as far as a versatility the versatility side of a wide receiver where he's running the nine route he's running that hitch that stop and go all the slants and just making these 50 50 grabs um not saying that dk or aj didn't do this from time to time but the consistency that mclaurin showed uh, with the lack of quarterback play, um, and I would say that he dealt with way worse talent than the other two. So I, I like Terry McLaurin a lot going into this season. I think that he has, you know, of, of these three, this might surprise some people, but I would say he has the best chance of becoming a wide receiver one in 2020. Based on how I think they're going to use him in the target share he's going to get, not to mention that the Redskins are going to suck. They're going to be down in games. They're going to be passing a lot. So if Dwayne Haskins is able to just get loose and throw the ball a lot, where is he going to go? Uh, So McLaurin, to me, is one of those sneaky, like, garbage time guys this year. Um, You know, that 900 yards, seven touchdowns last year. Yeah, I'm thinking he can repeat on that and and then some. So I I really like McLaurin when it comes to, you know, when I'm talking about these three guys, especially when the value uh, you're going to get him at. Okay, so let's get into David Montgomery. Um, you know, David Montgomery had a good season last year. Um, and I, I wouldn't say he broke out just yet. So, you know, we're waiting for that breakout, but you know, he had a decent rookie year, you know, I mean, we, what did we want? We wanted about 250 carries. He gave us that, um, he gave us almost 900 yards and I think I'm not looking at right now, six touchdowns. Look, you know, what can we expect from David Montgomery? I think it comes down to what you believe this Bears offense can do. So, John, we'll start with you. Dave Montgomery, breakout or fakeout? Yeah, so I I think there's two guys that we can really look at heading into 2020 that running backs that are not going to be going near the top of the drafts, whether it's dynasty or redraft, that we can count on for close to 300 touches if they're healthy. It's Le'Veon Bell and David Montgomery. At his current price in redraft and dynasty, I'm all over David Montgomery. There's such little competition there. Tariq Cohen's there. Obviously, he's going to eat up a good amount of the target share. Right. But on the ground, I we're going to see at least 240 carries. We're hoping to see a little bit more from that offensive line here in 2020. But I expect Nick Foles to be the starting quarterback there. And this is going to be... 
I, I'm not a huge Mitchell Trubisky fan, so I think Nick Foles, he's definitely a step up, and he's somebody that likes to utilize the running backs in the passing game. So like I said, Tariq Cohen, David Montgomery, I think he will see an uptick, and we just need some positive touchdown or regression, and we could be talking about David Montgomery. I'm not saying he's a running back one, but at his current price, he doesn't have to be. Give me the usage for me, you know, if we're going breakout or fake out, I'm going to have him as a breakout. I love it. And Josh, um, let us know that uh, Fantasy Pros ECR, if you would. And then, you know, just want to mention that, you know, John, you were talking about Tariq Cohen, 104 targets for Tariq Cohen. Um, and, you know, he, he really didn't do a lot with those, unfortunately. You know, no one really produced uh, out of that offense besides Allen Robinson. Um, but, you know, I, I think that Cohen is just – going on just very very slept on right now i think cohen can be drafted and 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 ppr leagues and then in dynasty i think that he's you know he's he's a buy right now for me actually but josh talk to us about david montgomery and based on that ecr if he's a breakout or fake out i'm all over him for a breakout i completely agree with everything john said uh currently right now as the consensus 24th running back in half PPR, he's going as the RB25 right now. So, I mean, if you're in a 12-team league, you're basically calling him, you know, like a fringe flex, fringe RB2 territory. Uh, we know how volatile the running back position is. So, I, I absolutely believe he is a, uh, you know, running back two this year. And, I mean, just as someone that watched a lot of the Bears games last year, and I think I said this on, you know, one of our episodes back in March, but, I mean, Matt Nagy is just pissed when he's <laughs> having to punt because Mitch Trubisky just cannot execute the offense. And like you said, Steve, I mean, dude, it all just comes down to how you think this Bears offense is going to run. So for me personally, I feel like Nick Foles is going to be installed as the starter from day one. Mm. I mean, it, I know there's going to be limited training camp, but I don't think they're going to need to see a whole lot to realize that Mitch Trubisky is still garbage. And Nick Foles is actually an upgrade, you know, as, as slight as it might be, I just feel like at, at a base level, this offense is going to be able to function more efficiently, more effectively. They'll be able to sustain more drives, move the sticks and just move the damn ball. So, you know, not having to punt, I mean, he'll have more opportunities. So I do think it is completely reasonable for him to, you know, get about 260 carries this year. Uh, I personally have him at about 260 on the dot. And I also have him at about 4.2 yards a clip, thinking that he's going to be a little more efficient because of the things I just mentioned. So I think he could be an 1,100 yard back uh, personally. And I do think he's going to also have an uptick in touchdowns as well. So um, anything that he gives us, um, you know, he only caught 25 passes last year, but, you know, if he can – you know, maybe add another 10, 12 catches on top of that. I mean, that's just gravy. Yeah, we were hoping for a little bit more work out of the passing game for David Montgomery, but they gave Tariq Cohen actually more targets uh, than he's ever had. And, you know, he's probably going to get around 90, 100 targets again. So I don't know if the passing game is something we can count on for Montgomery. Like you said, anything on top of that, anything on top of that 240, 250 carries is great. Um, but yeah, you know, if you like volume, you're going to like David Montgomery. If you look at David Montgomery film, um, I was watching the other day and I started saying to myself when I was looking at him, pat, pat, bop. And John and Josh, you both have kids, right? So you guys know these noises, but watch his film and you'll see that he makes this quick stutter step and runs right, right into a defender every time. So I call that the pat, pat, bop. It's quick two step and then he gets tackled up immediately he goes nowhere and it's like all this work all this work that he's doing with with his movements trying to get trying to get separation uh it was extremely inefficient i mean he's moving around a lot if you just watch his film you know what i'm talking about and then he gets gobbled up it it's just not effective how he's running right now along with the fact that the bears offense was just not good last year so both of those things didn't work out if he can find space after those first couple moves that he puts on and he can actually like, you know, cause it was very rare that you saw David Montgomery running in space and breaking out. Um, then you're really looking at a guy that can go from like 900 yards to maybe like 1200 yards. 
Um, it, just, yeah. it, it just really all depends on how this Bears offense is going to function um, and if they can get him in space. Yeah, let me ask you this. How many times when you were watching Bears games from last year, uh, when you're going back and looking at this tape, did it not seem bizarre that the more frustrated Matt Nagy got, he was using Montgomery on like third downs when you're thinking, well, where's Tariq Cohen? And then like on a lot of short yardage plays, you know, like later in the games, I noticed he would do this. And then Montgomery, it's like perfect for him. And then Cohen's in there and they're giving him at the ball at the goal line. And it's like, dude, what you guys have this backwards. Like, what are you doing? And that personally led to a lot of frustration for me in a couple of leagues where, you know, I had some shares of Montgomery personally. Um, but yeah, I still love him in dynasty, man. I'm just hoping that, you know, Nagy and the offense can kind of maybe not be so, uh, so pissed off during game days and maybe execute a little more efficiently and, that kind of opens the door, like you said. So, well, yeah, you got Nagy calling terrible plays. You got Mitch Trubisky scared out of his mind. I mean, he looks – I mean, if you ever look back at, like, Tony Romo and, like, that panic look that Tony Romo had. like the hair, hair on fire. Yeah, Mitch Trubisky just has that times 10. And then you give it to the pat-pat bop, and it's just like, what is going on with this offense? <laughs> but <laughs> – um, I, I will say that, you know, Montgomery is a good running back. I still believe in that. And that running back 24, you're really, it's not a big risk with the volume, you know, he's going to get. So I, I will say that I am expecting a breakout for David Montgomery. And I think that he can get into that top, you know, he can get close to that top 15 range. You know, there's a lot of good running backs out there, but there aren't situations like this all over the place where, you know, that you're going to get that, uh, you know, close to 300 touches, just like John was alluding to. So I think an interesting thing here with David Montgomery and the next guy we're going to talk about is the variance in how we perceive these two teams in the Bears, who not very inspiring, as we've talked about, and the 49ers, who went to the Super Bowl. And now we have to talk about their running back, Raheem Mostert, who had a fantastic end to the season uh, and that carried into the playoffs, into the Super Bowl. And it just seems like there's no doubt that he is the guy, but we know that Kyle Shanahan likes to use multiple backs and Raheem Mostert is being drafted in the fourth round, right around Dave Montgomery, but actually a couple spots behind. So John, I mean, is this the breakout for Raheem Mostert at age 28 or is this a fake out? It was a great story. What we saw last year, just like you said, he, he's 28 years old. So a little bit older when you look at it from a dynasty and, uh, you know, running back age perspective. But I think, again, I think people are going to be really disappointed with Raheem Mostert. Kevin Coleman, he's not going anywhere. And if you remember, Coleman was going through some injuries last year, and he looked really good for a short stretch. And then Raheem Mostert got the run there towards the end of the season. But I just, I have Mostert slated in for 2020 as a mid running back three. So if I had to make that decision, Raheem Mostert, David Montgomery, it's a really easy one for me. I'm definitely going David Montgomery. So for me, if we're saying fake out or breakout, it's going to be a fake out for me. Yeah, it's a good point because both are going around the same ADP. But like we said, we know that David Montgomery is going to get this work. And with Raheem Mostert, I mean, what if he just gives you 150 carries? I mean, are you really comfortable drafting him in the fourth round? That's a great point. Josh, how are you feeling about Mostert? Again, man, I'm uh, boring, boring podcast content, but I agree with John. Like, I just – you know, all the bears, you know, we talked about the bears, all they had to do is just hang on to this guy and they would have had a starting running back on their hands. Um, but you know, uh, it's Kyle Shanahan is a, is a hot hand running back guy. He's always been, his dad has always been, uh, that's, that's just how they are, man. Like when you get into a game, you know, some players just, they fit that game better, whether it's the way the scheme effectiveness is being played out uh, whether he sees something against the defense. I mean, it, it happens, and it, and it happens more with running back than any other position. And that's – I mean, we saw that last year. We saw, um, you know, 
games where I already talked about it earlier, where Jeff Wilson scores three touchdowns, or he most scores four touchdowns. You know, Tevin Coleman scores four touchdowns. If that's not a anti bell cow sentiment, I don't know what is. I mean, that's 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 a hot hand team all the way, and that's what the 49ers are going to do. They're going to give it to whoever works, and they're going to do it you know, repeatedly. So it's, you never know. I mean, it's going to be a lot closer to uh, a timeshare than I think people are leading, uh, being led to believe. And for me, that ranking of Raheem Mostert, uh, it's a little generous and I would much rather have somebody like David Montgomery over him. And uh, it's not, uh, it's not even, you know, format dependent. I would just straight up rather in a vacuum, I'd rather have Montgomery over Mostert. Yeah, you really- And Josh, just like you said real quick, I think it's kind of like a cop-out answer again. And it's one of those typical answers that we always hear with wide receivers that are boomer bust, but Raheem Mostert, he's going to be a really good best ball running back. Just right. like you said, I think that that ceiling and we've seen it, you know, any one of those 49ers running backs, they could pop off four touchdowns in a game. Is David Montgomery going to have that ceiling? No, but I do think David Montgomery is going to be more reliable from that week to week outlook. But yeah, I, th- I think Raheem most of the, the ceiling is there. But again, if it's not best ball, I'm not comfortable having him as my running back to or heck, even a flex play. That's a good point because David Montgomery could end up the you know RB21 and Mostert could end up the RB31. But that variance in week to week production is just going to hurt your team more than anything with Raheem Mostert potentially. If we right. use Tevin Coleman like we think, and you know, what if Jarek McKinnon all of a sudden is healthy? I mean, that is possible. Exactly. Um, they, well, it's just, dude. There's just so much opportunity for fantasy owners to be disappointed. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So it's like you know, you you want to take your shot on guys, but I think there are other running backs like some of these rookies that you can take your shot on. Um, but most are, I think will have the value, like you said, but it just it's it's going to be tough to depend on him week to week. Um, let's get into Cortland Sutton, and you know Sutton, in my opinion, broke out last year. Um, he looked like a wide receiver one by all accounts, and then you bring in his quarterback Drew Locke, who had some success at the end of the year. He's going to be the undisputed starter going into twenty twenty. So you like that combination, um, but wait, they draft Jerry Judy uh, with high draft capital. Um, they get KJ Hamler to really revamp this whole wide receiver court in general. Noah Fant in year two plus Melvin Gordon. So, you know, there are a lot of mouths to feed to be cliche. So John, you know, Talk to me about Cortland Sutton in both redraft and dynasty. Uh, you know, is it a breakout in 2020 or is it a fake out? I like Cortland Sutton a lot, especially looking at it with dynasty. But for redraft, the, the thing that concerns me, and yeah, there's a lot of mouths to feed and you're bringing in Melvin Gordon. You, Noah Fan is returning and then you have Judy, Hamler, you know, Hamilton if he gets any run at all. But the, the, you look at the splits last year between – Joe Flacco and Drew Locke. When Locke came in, the target share still held for Cortland Sutton, but the total yards dropped significantly. If you're projecting out 16 games, the you know you look at his his um, his PPR ranking. He was 12th on pace for 12th as a wide receiver, or 14th for uh, the season under Joe Flacco when he was a quarterback, but then it dropped to 25th whenever Drew Locke came in. And now, like you said, additional weapons in that offense, that's not going to help his case. So for me, it's going to be a situation where he's going earlier than I would take him in redraft. I'm, I'm fading him, and he's going to be a uh, fake out for me here in 2020. I think people are going to be a little disappointed whenever we look at his weekly output and then we put it all together for his end of season uh, totals. I was ready for the breakout for sure. You know, I mean, and again, like I said, I think that he like fits the mold of a dominant wide receiver in this league, but yes, now that they've added the weapons and what I think that Drew Locke wants to do, um, I'm questioning the target share. So that's why I question 
if he can outperform his ADP. And then Josh, if you could talk to us about that ECR for fantasy pros, where he's at there. Um, and then what do you think if he's breakout or fake out? Yeah, pretty telling, you know, he's ranked as the 21st and this is in uh, PPR. So tr- ranked as the 21st and he's currently going as the wide receiver 18. So he's actually, you know, three spots back of where he's going, contrary to popular opinion, you know, the experts actually aren't as high on Sutton and uh, probably no coincidence that I agree with you guys because, um, you know, just the only thing I'll be quick. Uh, the only thing that um, I can kind of, you know, put the cherry on top of everything that John said was, you know, the catch rate also took a major hit once, uh, you know, Drew Locke came aboard. So, uh, I think it's no coincidence that all these things kind of tie in together, uh, you know, still seeing a lot of targets, but just not being as productive. And I mean, if that's who your quarterback is, um, you know, we talked about it with the wide receiver episode. I'm, I'm a huge guy on wide receiver and QB rapport. Um, obviously these guys are both young. They have a lot of time to work on this together. Um, you know, maybe a little, a little bit limited off season, obviously this, this year, but, uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm, also down on Sutton and I, I don't think he's worth where he's going right now in drafts. And I, I even have him with a 24% target share and I'm just, it's still only bringing him to right around wide receiver 25. Now, if they do spread the ball out a little bit more, we see fewer pass attempts because they want to make a bigger commitment to the run. You have, um, you know, Mike Munchak, the, the running back coach or the, uh, the line coach there. And I'm familiar with him living here in Pittsburgh, you know, one of the best offensive line coaches in the league. So I think we're going to see more of a commitment to the run. We know that defense is pretty strong. And I just, if there's any downtick in total pass attempts or even that 24% target share, which I have him slated at, we might not even be talking about him as a a mid wide receiver three. And again, I think that's going to upset some people. Yeah. I compare Cortland Sutton a little bit to like a Kenny Galladay light and I'm just picturing Cortland Sutton on the Lions right now, Josh. And, like, what if Cortland Sutton was there instead of Kenny Galladay? I mean, do you think he would be producing like Kenny Galladay is? Or do you think he he wouldn't be able to to do it? Like, I feel like Marvin Jones would be – we would be questioning, like, who's that wide receiver one? Is it it Marvin Jones or is it Cortland Sutton where, like, we know it's Kenny Galladay? Like, I feel like if people are projecting Cortland Sutton to be that kind of guy, like a top ten guy, I think they're mistaken. You bite your tongue. How dare you compare Corlin to Kenny Galladay? <laughs> well, which, and Josh and and Josh is our you know our resident com, com, Kenny Galladay truther. So yeah, I mean he's uh, you you go back and look at these guys last season, and yeah, they both made some you know pretty fantastic catches. But if you put Kenny Galladay's top ten catches last year next to Cortland Sutton's top ten catches. Uh, one of them's going to leave you with your jaw dropped and the other one's not. So that's, that's, that's all I'll say there. Yeah. I mean, you know, Sutton had some great, great plays last year and it really did, uh, you know, show me that he can be that guy. So I, I just, it, the off season has really kind of, pro, you know, um, changed my projection of Cortland Sutton because I think before the NFL draft, I was, I was really, you know, thinking that, he could potentially be a wide receiver one in that category, you know, close to that wide receiver 12. Uh, But now I just don't think it's possible because I think Judy is really damn good. Um, And I think he can produce right away. Um, You know, and Locke is going to be, you know, I I don't think he has to rely on Sutton too much. I think he can spread it around. He has a lot of talent there, Um, you know, with Noah Fant, a guy who I'm really high on, um, who I think that is, is a playmaker, who he's going to find and want to rely on, um, you know, especially on these dink and dunks, you know, you know, Noah Fant can be a big body. Um, but what's really great about Fant from the tight end position is he can take those, those, you know, 10 yard catches and turn them into 20, 30 yarders. So um, definitely he has, Drew Locke has some weapons there. So let's talk about Drew Locke. Um, all of a sudden Drew Locke is like, the fantasy darling, you know, uh, he's one of those guys who's a candidate to be a top 10 guy uh, that you can get very late in drafts. So 
you know, John, I'll start with you. Are you looking at uh, Drew Locke as a guy that you can get at the end of drafts who could have that kind of potential? I don't mind him in my super flex spot. So looking at it from the dynasty side first, and this is a shameless plug for dynasty theory, but right before the NFL draft, it was the night before we actually had Woody page on the show and Anybody that knows Woody, he's very close to that Denver team. And one, he told us that the Broncos wanted Jerry Judy, and they ended up getting him. But he also said the thoughts in Denver and within that organization, they want Drew Locke to be the guy. And they said he just kind of has that it factor. And you can see it. He, he, he really does exude confidence, and he has that swagger. But when you talk about Drew Locke, I think one of the big things that people will talk about, and there's always these different things that people bring up in these hot button topics for different players. And one of them for Drew Locke is, well, look at his supporting cast. And I think very little of it has to do with Drew Locke himself, but what they're building around him. And it seems like the confidence they have in him. So for dynasty, I like him a lot because I still think in, in some situations, some startups, some leagues, you're getting that discount because yeah, there's still a little uncertainty, even though the hype train it's, it's pretty much leaving the station. But for redraft, especially if I'm in a one quarterback league, I would actually prefer to go in a different direction, maybe like a Gardner Minshew at that point in the draft if I'm fading quarterback. Super flex, sure. Let me have him in my super flex spot. But I just, based on what we expect for their, their splits between rushing attempts and passing attempts and the pace of play, I just, I can't see him finishing close to a, a top 12 quarterback here in 2020 now is he going as a top 12 quarterback in redraft leagues I, I would be very surprised but for me just based on the expectations I'm going to have to say it's a fake out but I, I really like Drew Locke I do despite everything I just said but I just I, I, don't, I don't think the ceiling is there that we could see with other quarterbacks that you could get around that range yeah, he's going behind guys like Roethlisberger, Mayfield, and Matthew Stafford, um, which I think makes sense. Now these guys have big upside. Josh, what are your thoughts on Drew Locke? Yeah, you know, going back to our uh, you know hot take startup that we did, and we talked about how kind of the draft you know fell fell off the hinges there at the the five six turn when all these quarterbacks were going, and I mean, it's something with Drew Locke went like the sixth round, and everyone kind of freaked out because I think that was like everybody's um, quarterback target there. <laughs> so like everyone just kind of freaked out and it caused this massive quarterback run. Um, but it's telling because I want to put him kind of at that very back end of the quarterbacks where, you know, he's, he's that last guy that you are comfortable kind of putting in there, you know, in a super flex. Um, but that being said, you know, I, I still have some guys ranked ahead of him, like, uh, you know, Jimmy G and, um, you know, fortunately I was like, I was lucky enough to get, um, Jimmy G after he was gone, but, uh, he starts to kind of get into that turf where, you, you know, you're not really sure if you're comfortable or not, like from a redraft perspective. Um, I, I guess it just kind of depends on, you know, how you think that this offense is going to progress. Uh, you know, Drew Locke comes in last year at the end of the season in week 13 and the Broncos go four and one. So, you know, the QB wins crowd is just like stammering and, you know, falling all over themselves as Adam Levitan would say to, to, to get, you know, some Drew Locke, but it's a, it's a scenario where really, I mean, he really only had like one good game and then he had a a couple, two, three solid games. Um, But is that enough in fantasy to kind of get us over the hump and redraft, you know, I don't think so, man. I mean, I think you're, you're better left, you know, investing somewhere else, Um, you know, because obviously I can't sit here and, you know, be down on uh, a little down on court and Sutton without also being a little bit down on drew lock. And, you know, it's not to say that I think the offense takes a step back or anything. Um, You know, drew lock just might sputter a little bit coming out of the gate. I just think it's kind of unreasonable to think that that pace is going to kind of play out and, you know, that the, that the uh, Broncos are going to end up winning, you know, going like 12 and four. I just, that's just probably not going to happen. So, um, you know, it, for me, it's, I'm probably going to pass on him. Uh, he's currently right now as a QB 23 ECR and going off the board at uh, the 24th. So 
you know, pretty much even Steve in there, but um, I still think you can trust guys like, you know, Philip Rivers, Jimmy G, and, um, you know, even Joe Burrow ahead of him. Wow. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're saying a lot there and I appreciate, you know, that stance because, you know, guys like Burrow and Garoppolo, I mean, you know, you're not going to have to pay much for them in redraft leagues, single quarterback leagues uh, where I think people are more hip to Drew Locke, even though it's not going to be like you have to, you know, reach for him if that's your guy. Um, and again, if that's your guy, go for him because, you know, you're, you're going to have to take a chance with one of these guys if you're waiting on a quarterback. I mean, he's going to be available. Um, maybe not in a dynasty startup with, you know, Marcus Grant and Frank Stample and all these guys. Um, but, it, you know, he's going to be, a, you know, and look, bef- before the draft, I-, I was thinking like, okay, Drew Locke is going to have some upside. You know, I, like, I like his confidence. I think that John Elway found his guy. And then they drafted Jerry Judy, and I'm like, man, okay. And then KJ Hamler, um, they got Albert O. Uh, so they're really just giving this guy weapons, you can tell. And then, of course, Melvin Gordon, you can tell they want him to succeed. Uh, just like Woody Page said on your on your show, John, uh, which was really cool insight, I'm sure, right before the draft. So, uh, yeah, I, I think that if I'm going to have to say, like, breakout or fake out, in general – I think Drew Locke is breaking out. I think that this, he's going to have a good year. Um, you know, it, I, I don't think you're going to have to pay a lot for him in redraft. So I, I think the breakout is real. Um, I, I think that he provides that top 10 upside with the weapons he has around him. The Broncos aren't necessarily thought of right now as this great offense based based on we just haven't seen it. You know, Joe Flacco isn't going to be behind a great offense. Uh, but this year they can be pretty good. You know, I think they'll they'll exceed expectations there. So I, I think the breakout for Drew Locke is real. John Bauer, thanks for coming on the show, man. Yeah, it's been a pleasure as always. Um, what do you have going on over there at Fantasy Pros? And you know, just talk to us a little bit about you know uh, your work with the Dynasty Theory. Yeah, so with Fantasy Pros, first of all, thank you guys so much for having me. This was an absolute blast, despite it being past my bedtime. But I kind of, you know, I rose above and I persevered here. But (laughs) for Fantasy Pros, I'm going to be pumping out the content. Like I said, here in July, I'm going to be having an article come out talking about uh, recency bias and kind of what we saw at the, the tail end of 2019 and how dynasty owners can kind of use that to their advantage, who we should be looking at more, who we should be fading, despite some of the outcomes that we had there at the end of the season. But, you know, over at Dynasty Theory, we have a fantastic lineup of guests, with, you know, up to this point, but also moving forward. And Steve, we're going to have you on the show this Sunday, kind of a Father's Day special there. But it, it's, I'm looking forward to it. But yeah, we a ton of great guests and just you know, the people that we've been able to connect with. But, you know, if you're not following us on Twitter and Instagram, it's at Dynasty Theory FF. And then you can find my personal account on Twitter at the Bauer Club. And, you know, we we do some cool giveaways. So if you're not following us, check us out. And then, you know, check out the show. We're on YouTube. And then we're also on the Ross Tucker Football Podcast Network. So you can find us on any platform that you typically listen to podcasts. Very nice. Yeah, John is a great follow over there on Twitter. Um, I want to say that we're going to have um, a couple good guests coming up here, uh, JJ Zachariasen and Ryan McDowell of DLF. Um, so tune in for those episodes. Of course, we're going to be on the Scott Fishbowl Podathon. That is July 5th going into July 6th because we're going to get the late night uh, <laughs> uh, spot with our man Salvito and all those guys over there at the Dynasty Funhouse. So we're very excited about that. Um, and then, of course, uh, be on the lookout uh, for the Player Profiler draft kit that has been released. Uh, I have some work released over there. Uh, did some player profilers or some player profiles for some of the uh, the players in 2020, including AJ Dillon, Kareem Hunt, um, and a couple of other guys. Uh, thanks for tuning in, guys. Uh, please subscribe um, on uh, Apple Podcasts and wherever, wherever you listen to podcasts. Um, and then follow us over on Twitter at FF Professor ST3 and then at Josh Daly72. Uh, on behalf of Josh Daly, my name is Steve Joy. This is Ben.